Risk is everywhere. It is a risk to get out of bed, take a sip of coffee, step into the street, shake someone's hand, eat a tuna melt. Trust risk betrayal. Authenticity risks rejection. And if you want to play it safe, doing nothing risks missing out on everything. We associate risk with what you might lose, but there is no winning in the marketplace without it. If anyone ever comes up to you and offers you something that is completely risk-free, buyer beware. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. I read this thing in Bloomberg Business Week about Silicon Valley Bank, which bought billions of dollars of bonds, a risk, and the value of those bonds fell, depositors went running out the door, and the impact of that risk was one of the biggest bank failures in the history of this country. What does it feel like to take risk in business and in life? We're gonna try to find out from actual risk takers. It's a risk, we're gonna take it together, and we're gonna take it tonight. It's the business Welcome to the Business Week show. Tonight, risk. The very idea of who gets to take financial risk in global markets and how they go about taking that risk and then how they talk about that risk changed thanks to tonight's first guest. In 2012, Jamie Rogozinski logged onto Reddit he started a new page and he called it Wall Street Bets. In the years that followed, it got millions of users. It sparked real frenzies in stocks like GameStop and AMC. And at one point, it got its own Super Bowl ad. But as you may imagine, things did not work out all that well for everyone. And Jamie is here tonight to tell us all about it. Jamie, seriously, thanks for being here. Thanks a lot for having me. Risk is a funny thing because it freaks some people out, me included, but there's also something about it that is so attractive and so tantalizing. Why have you been so drawn to it? Risk is a funny thing because when, when people say risk, especially when you frame it that way, the implication is either there's an element of randomness, right, or that the outcome can be very, very costly because it's either unlikely to pay out or the actual um, you know, chance of losing might be really costly. But the way that I see risk is, is really, if you're able to actually quantify those elements, it's, it's really a price that you pay for an opportunity. The way that I look at risk in that, in that sense, it's not that I'm attracted to, to these thrill seeks. It's, I think this is worth it, right? I think I can identify these are the probabilities or possibilities, and sometimes I can't, but at least can, I can map them out. And this is what the possible outcome is. And I'm like, let's do this. Okay, let, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's really talk about that. Because what you're saying is you're really talking about what it means for something to be risky. When you started Wall Street Bets, mm -hmm. the way you've talked about it is that you said you wanted a place where people could talk about risky ideas and they could talk about it kind of proudly, risky trade ideas. You were enabling other people to take risks. So can you tell us, like, what worries what worries did you have at the time that things potentially could, could go wrong for them? You know, my, my definition, my, my understanding and my position on risk has evolved, right? It's, it's become clear as the years gone by. And early on, I justified this by saying, well, look, they're all adults. You have to be 18 by the, you know, in order to open up a brokerage. Same thing if you go to a casino, you know, everyone can go through. And when I said I want to be able to discuss high risk, I wanted to discuss high risk, high return, right? It wasn't just... High risk is throwing your money out the window and <laughs> having it go away with 100% certainty. Uh, this was high risk with the possibility of making money. And those two obviously go hand in hand. There are some that are irresponsible with it, but I can't make myself responsible in the, much the same way that there's gambling addicts, right? But outside of that, what I start seeing is a learning process, much like the one that I personally went through. I lost tons of money, but I walked away with so much knowledge and understanding and hands-on experience that a textbook can never explain to you. I want to ask you about someone who sort of counts as your really, really complete opposite, Jack Bogle. He was the founder of Vanguard. He helped popularize the very vanilla, very boring idea that if you're an investor, you can diversify your bets. He ended up popularizing the index fund. How did it feel that you, in, in some ways, were kind of singularly responsible for changing the way that just millions of people think about investing. What, what did that feel like? 
It was humbling for sure. Uh, you know, it was unexpected to see the enthusiasm. I, if I were to have predicted the outcome of it, it would have been people looking down at this particular type of activity. Uh, secretly, it was almost a, a goal of mine. But the the beauty of it is what conservative investors do, Bogle, Buffett, you know, whatever it might be, is no different than what gamblers that literally go to sit at a roulette table do. The changes in the vision that Wall Street bets were, it was it, it demystified the idea of finance to people that might otherwise think it's just Excel sheets and discounted cash flows. You also took a different kind of risk and you sued Reddit and you lost. Will you tell us a little bit about what that felt like? <laughs> Terrible. Yeah, that was probably in the top <laughs> five riskiest things, if not three. You know, I get kicked out and the stubbornness behind Reddit, the, you know, they've never answered. I tried pleading and sorries and threats and back channels and lawyers. And they, they would just be like, no, nah, you're done. You're... They got to a point where they said, no, we're done trying to negotiate. We want to take you to court with this. And I said, all right, well, I guess now, now I have to actually go to court. And so this is when I decided to, to counter sue them. So and it didn't feel like a risk. It felt like just so something you had to do. I needed to do a foreclosure. I still had a chip on my shoulder and I couldn't fully commit to anything. And I'd still kind of look at, every time I'd see Wall Street bets on the news or people talking about it, I would, it would still have that kind of, of sour feeling. And so, and, and I needed to get past that. And I'm like, look, if I lose, I lose. And then it was, it was, it is what it is. And it would have been a, 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 the fight of <laughs> uh, the century for me or my lifetime for me, but, but but then I can be at peace. Right? Is, is that how you feel now? Are you at peace? Unfortunately not, um, because it's not over yet. Um, I would have liked the I, I would have liked for the judge to have been like, no, dude, you lose and, and it's over. You know, I don't want to cover too much on the legal side of things, but the judge, let's just say they, they, they left plenty of room for maneuvering. Um, so so unfortunately it's not over. I was told, um, I really don't know what it is. I was told you brought an object, I think, that maybe uh, encapsulates risk. I think Natasha, my colleague, is going gonna, is gonna to pass it to us, I do believe. What is this? Okay. All right. Tell, tell us about, tell us about this guy. You're familiar with this? Yeah. R remind, remind me. <laughs> so this is, a, uh, this is from a meme, right? It says, this is fine. It's a little dog. And, and this encapsulates so much of both my life and my ability to handle emotions, especially with the, the volatility of markets, but also life in general. It gives you so many ups and downs and so mm. many ways to go through it. Oftentimes when faced with adversity, my composure resembles this. It's like, yeah, don't mm. worry about it. I'll Can I see okay. him? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, this is mine now. Uh, <laughs> Jamie, thank you so much for being here. Love having you. Not a problem. Thank you very much for having me. We have more risk coming up next. <laughs> When executives across corporate America want to take a little risk or manage it, they often turn to Wall Street. And there is no entity on Wall Street with a more interesting relationship to risk, including Wall Street bets, than the company Goldman Sachs. And when I think about Goldman, which I do often because I'm a Wall Street reporter, my mind often turns to Maeve Duvalli. Maeve is a longtime media executive and until recently was a managing director at Goldman. The truth of the matter is, we have a cordial relationship, but a kind of antagonistic one because it's my job to report on Wall Street's money and power, and it's her job to push back. Recently, I finished her wonderful memoir, Maeve Rising, which is an account of her journey from being a lonely and angry person to the woman who is sitting at this table with me right now. Maeve Duvalli, welcome. Max, thanks for having me. You know, I would I would say we don't have a antagonistic relationship. I would say that we've locked horns through the years. Okay, is well, that is that a better characterization? I think uh, that's a better characterization. But I'm going to ask you in just a couple of minutes about all kinds of risks that you that you have taken, okay. personally and professionally. Sure. But I feel like we should start first things first. Yep. Why is risk, which is really, I mean, it's just a fancy way of saying basically the, the things that can go wrong. Why is risk so important to the work that happens on Wall Street? Well, from a market perspective, obviously managing market risk, um, managing operational risk that somebody pushes a button they're not supposed to, and the trade that happens is bigger than it was supposed to be. Those are obvious risks. Um, and 
you know, there's also kind of macro risk, right? That a central bank does something that people weren't expecting. But the kind of risk that I manage, and incidentally, everybody at Goldman Sachs is taught they have to manage is reputational risk. Okay. So I want to talk about uh, 2018. I think my favorite page of your book. You put on makeup at the office for the first time. What I really want to ask about is like, tell me about the day. Like, what, what do you remember in full about, about that day in 2018? Well, it was the day of uh, the Knight Badgett Fellowship Dinner, which you've probably been to. Knight Badgett Fellowship is a, is a fellowship for mid-career financial journals at Columbia University. I'm an uh, alumni of that program and also on the board of Knight Badgett Fellowship. It's really a, a nice gathering. I usually look forward to the dinner, but sometime early that afternoon, I literally um, had this overwhelming feeling and desire that I needed to, to wear makeup to the event that evening. And once I had that thought, I couldn't get it out of my mind. And I bolted out the door and uh, walked a third of a mile to the closest Sephora and bought a bunch of makeup, which I put on at the end of the day. And I went to that dinner with some makeup on for the first time. You put on the makeup, you end up kind of negotiating with yourself. And you say to yourself that you basically have this, this barrel of femininity and you think like, should I, should I just keep the lid on? You know, should I just keep the lid on? What would you have risked if, if you had done that? I think that would have been impossible, but if I did that, I would have been miserable. I was wondering when I read your book, how it felt to kind of risk your male pr privilege. You were risking your male, male pr privilege in a male dominated industry. I'm certain I had male privilege, and I'm certain through the years I exercised male privilege, but I, I wasn't really consciously aware of it. And to be perfectly honest, um, it's, it's not something that really matters to me. When it's time for you to choose a name, you pick one that means she who intoxicates. Yeah. Which blew me away when I read it because right before, I mean months before, you stopped drinking. You mm. stopped drinking. Um, why, why did you quit? Well, um, I had had a series of progressively bad bottoms. My last bottom, which was in January of 2018, I uh, holed myself up in an apartment. I only left to get alcohol. I drank around the clock and I made an attempt on my life. So um, if I continue drinking, um, I'm convinced that I would have killed myself. After that episode, I made a decision that I wanted to live. And I knew if I wanted to live, I had to stop drinking. Look, I mean, we have a professional relationship. So part of me feels like it's hard to say this, but it's also hard not to say it. You know, I'm, I'm glad you made that decision. A lot of people who are miserable, they don't get out of their misery. Yeah. You know, they, they stay there. So the, the reality is there are a lot of drug addicts and alcoholics in the world, and the vast majority of them do not get sober and do not get clean and they die alcoholic and addict deaths. That's, that's the reality. So those of us who have made it to recovery um, don't take it for granted, number one, and two, realize that it was a gift. And uh, it's a gift that has to be um, nourished all the time because mm. if you take it for granted, you're gonna wind up right back on the street. When you came out, yeah. you got, I think, literal bouquets from traders at yeah. Goldman. I think you got like these very warm notes from people, I think you got phone calls. Yeah. Those were from traders and they were not from investment bankers. And you write in the book, with Clarity, investment bankers were quiet. I was so surprised by that. What, can you, can you explain that? Why, why did that happen? I think probably some of my relationships with investment bankers were shallower than I thought. And I think investment bankers are very good at uh, having um, really expansive, uh, relationships kind of across a wide uh, group of people, but you know maybe some of those relationships aren't as deep um, as they would appear. I love that you're accusing investment bankers writ large of a certain kind of interpersonal shallowness. I hope, I hope, <laughs> I'm not sure I said yes, it exactly well, that, that exactly way. as you said. Yeah. No, no. no. I, I'm I'm hoping that you'll. You're not going to put words in my mouth, well, are you? Well, I'm I'm the interviewer now. Yeah. Um, you know, I asked you earlier about male privilege. Coming out as trans in the milieu of, first of all, New York City, where we are, but also co a, a corporation, which I'm sure, as I'm 
also keenly aware, has a lot of pressures too. Can you talk, if, if you want to at all, about, I don't know, maybe the, the kind of privileges that come with uh, having a, a really good career as, as you do? Sure. So I, I, I certainly have white privilege. I have the privilege of having worked at Goldman Sachs. I'm relatively well off. I live in the Chelsea section of New York, which is arguably the best place to be an out transgender person in the world. And even before I left Goldman Sachs, I began to, and I've continued to be, an advocate or activist for the LGBTQ community more broadly. Because, you know, not everybody is in a position to speak out. Not everybody wants to speak out. But I'm in a position to, and I want to speak out, so I'm going to. Thank you so much for being here. I, I, I really enjoyed this. Thanks for having me, Max. <laughs> If the names Rizza, Jizza, and Old Dirty Bastard mean anything to you, or if you've ever been moved by the music of A Tribe Called Quest or D'Angelo, then you owe a debt of thanks to Sophia Chang. As an artist manager and as a music label executive, she helped shape the landscape of a golden age of New York City rap in the 1990s in a way that would be totally under-celebrated if it weren't for her own book, which is called The Baddest Bitch in the Room. It's a book about the music business, but it's also a book about taking risks, some that work out and some that don't. We've talked tonight about personal risks. We've talked about professional risks. We've talked about financial risks. Sophia's story is a story about what happens when those things come together. Sophia Chang, welcome to the show. I am so excited to be here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You manage Old Dirty Bastard without any experience as a manager. You ran RZA's record label without any experience running a record label. I think you say in the book that risk is in my DNA. Did I? You do. I wonder if I plagiarized that from somebody. That's really clever. <laughs> risk taking was in my DNA. <laughs> Sophia, what, why is that? I would say certainly my parents' stories have a lot to do with that. My mother, Tung Suk Chang, born in 1932, she escaped North Korea when she was 14. She was one of 10 siblings. That was mm. a huge risk. It was a very risky boat ride. My father, he was, God rest his soul, he was estranged from his father and he took a risk when he studied mathematics in Vancouver. They went to Canada to build a better life for their family. So none of that was explicit in my head as a child, but I think that that's probably the model. And I think the other thing that really supported my journey and my risk taking was that my parents, every move that I made, they encouraged me. After I moved to New York, I didn't have a job. I didn't have a place. Their, their peers would say, your daughter, what's she doing? Get well, her back. They, had, they would have had a good answer because when you moved to New York, I think one of the first jobs you had was working for Paul, Paul Simon. Simon. Yeah. Paul Simon had a personal assistant who I think was a Korean American woman. That's right. And I think she, taught you almost explicitly that it was important for you to, to take up space in yes. a room. How is, you know, not just confidence, but something like unapologetic confidence, how, how is that a risk? I think when you take an intersectional view of this, right, when you think about the fact that I am a woman and I am Asian and I mostly navigated, Max, very male-dominated milieu. And yes, I remember her name is Sonia Che, God rest her soul. And I remember watching her move and I thought, wow. And she would just, and she was smaller than me. She would just burst into a room and you could just feel her. She didn't mm. have to yell. She didn't have to do any of that. But her energy just emanated off of her. And I really took that lesson from her. But, you know, it occurs to me that you talk about losing the fear of embarrassing yourself. Yes. I think when you're at like Atlantic Records yeah. in an early job. Yeah. People have a fear of embarrassing themselves for a reason, because it's, it's, it's self-protected. It's a, it's a kind of shield. Yeah. So it occurs to me to ask, you know, maybe, maybe the question I really want to know is why, why is it so risky to, to be yourself? I think that in general, we as humans operate out of fear, just in general. So if we're in a meeting and there are 10 people sitting around the table and maybe I'm junior and I have an idea, my fear, and even if I think it's so small, my fear is I open my mouth and everybody goes, and it's like the record scratch, <laughs> rewind, and then everybody looks. I think we all live with a real 
fear of humiliation, embarrassment, excommunication, reprisal. Right. So I have gotten to the point where I just don't care. I mean, it's so incredibly liberating not to care what other people think. It doesn't mean that I don't get my feelings hurt. For me to be out here speaking as openly and fearlessly as I do, I know from people who come up to me that I'm setting an example. One way of thinking about risk is that it's like, it's a kind of bet on the unknown. Yes, of course. It's a way of endorsing one kind of future mm -hmm. over another. What are the risks, or maybe a single risk, that you still want to take? I feel like I take risks all the time. I feel like my life is full of risk and that does feel reckless, but you know, I'm, I just turned 58 and I wanna fall in love again. And that's really scary for a woman over, shh, that's scary for a woman over 35. Never mind a woman over 40, over 50, close to 60. And what does that mean for a woman of a certain age to wanna fall in love again? Well, that means you've gotta put yourself out there. That's a risk because of patriarchy, because of ageism, because of all of those things. Well, I wish you love and I wish you many happy Thank rest. Thank you. Sophia Chang, seriously, I loved having you here. And I love being here. Thank you so, so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Tonight, our three guests with three very different careers showed us that you can take just about any risk you want at work and outside of work if you've got the risk appetite and you're in the market for it. You can create a mechanism for other people to take all sorts of outlandish bets on stocks and options. You can reintroduce yourself at your very fancy job without a guarantee that your colleagues are gonna appreciate the change. You can take a job in a big business that you're not really qualified for, and then if you don't like it, you can leave. What you can't do, according to these three interviews, is know for certain what the payoff's gonna be before you take the risk. The best you can do Think carefully about the risks you want to take. Think about why you want to take them. Reconsider the risks you've taken already and wonder about the risks that are still to come. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. The biggest and most <laughs> consistent lie that I've told in the workplace is telling my clients and or members of Wu-Tang Clan what time the lobby call is or what time the flight is and making it an hour earlier than it actually is. But they've all, they all figured that one out a long time ago. So you just have to keep moving it back. In terms of what causes me the most anxiety, it's when a new story I worked on didn't quite turn out like I planned. That's when you can get into trouble, when um, people have an unexpected negative surprise. What's the worst thing that I've ever done professionally? Oh man, these existential questions, what is bad? There's not, nothing that I can recall that was not moral or not ethical. Mistakes, on the other hand, I've made plenty of those, but all of those have been good, right? They were all, they were all step stones to, to, to succeeding, to being able to creating, to be able to, to, to actually fulfilling stuff. I wouldn't say that I've had one sweeping gesture of generosity, you know, and you got a car, you got a car, you got a car. I've never been in that position. What I do that manifests generosity is telling people they're doing a great job and always giving them credit when it's due. And it costs nothing.